Ladies and gentlemen, <clears throat> sometimes it's important to state the obvious. My experience today, and yours, at the end of probably a very long day, is the infrastructure of this city. What do I mean by that? It's the route, it's the subway below ground, it's the parks that we might have crossed, it's the physicality, the DNA of the city, which is far more important, notwithstanding the fact that we're mostly architects and passionate about buildings. It's the urban glue that binds together those individual buildings. That's urbanization, and that buildings, infrastructure, urbanization, that's really what I'd like to share some thoughts, some experiences this evening. I left school at 16, and this was my first experience of architecture. And my God, what architecture, what a masterpiece. Alfred Waterhouse, finished in 1877. The brief was a scheme equal to, if not superior, to any building in the country at any cost which may be reasonably required. And it was publicly funded. And it's, it's just absolutely breathtaking. So at the age of 16, not knowing anything really about architecture, but being very, very moved by this building, I would discover other buildings Thank God for that. Uh, whether it was Kendall Milnes, which I since attributed to the influence of Auguste Perret uh, by, um, by uh, Bourne, um, whether it was the Daily Express building, which was a very long walk in the lunch break, um, by Owen Williams, the engineers. But I was, I was also drawn uh, Again, without knowing words like infrastructure, I was drawn to the squares, to Piccadilly, to Albert Square, to the arcades, uh, which were built during the construction period of the, of the town hall. These were urban uh, shortcuts inspired by the Great Exhibition of 1851. Um, so, <clears throat> before I started architecture school, uh, I was generously given a year's edition of the Architectural Review. And I remember so well the outrage issues of the Architectural Review where people like Gordon Cullen were a kind of social conscience and would draw attention to the terrible things that were happening uh, in the name of, uh, of progress, uh, civic vandalism, uh, destroying, taking the heart out of uh, villages and towns. And, um, <clears throat> and later in 1964, and Ian Nairn, a kind of social conscience here anticipating the Covent Garden um, uh, transformation when the flower market went out one decade uh, later. And as a student in my third year uh, in 1956, I was, um, I was traveling and analyzing civic spaces, public spaces, and, and in a way emulating the work of those individuals, I was uh, I was drawing the, the, the spaces, pacing them out, measuring them, sketching them. Um, and at the same time, I was also hugely impressed by uh, the Galleria, which connected La Scala with the, with the cathedral. Um, and again, was the same date as, the, uh, as Manchester Town Hall. <clears throat> and, um, and here as a third year student, I'm trying to analyze those, those spaces. Um, and I'm thinking of them as outdoor rooms. I'm acutely aware of this civic dimension. And I think that that passion for uh, civic spaces is, is a powerful influence uh, as an architect and, and really conditions in all kinds of ways uh, how one approaches the design. So, um, so perhaps it's no accident that, uh, that the great court of the British Museum is essentially an urban room, potentially a, a shortcut uh, across the building, as well as fulfilling uh, its, it, its role in terms of connectivity with the, with the many galleries. Um, 
And also, every time I, I pass the Houses of Parliament, I feel that sense of outrage at the banality uh, of achieving the security and sometimes uh, just going back into the past, you realize that perhaps the best solution to issues like security is to dissolve it totally. And at the time that we did Trafalgar Square, we also postulated the idea that Parliament Square should be pedestrianized. And, um, and this is from that study at the time, going back to the year 2000. And I always hesitate to show Trafalgar Square because I feel it's so obvious. But then I'm reminded that perhaps uh, not everybody was necessarily around at the time in the late 90s when uh, it was like this and that has transformed to this with, with many, many side benefits in terms of uh, prosperity percolating outwards uh, from, those, uh, from those changes. And, um, and perhaps it's that attitude to urbanism which produces a bridge which has its infrastructure above the eye level essentially evaporates, disappears, so it doesn't interfere with the axis of St Paul's. Uh, or indeed the Tate Gallery in the opposite direction. So more than just creating a kind of blade of, of, of light. And perhaps some of the tools that we have at our disposal now are less subjective and we can analyze, as we have done here with space syntax, um, the state of connectivity before the bridge uh, was installed. And you can see the dark line of the river. And as the colors get warmer, then it's telling us that really things are better connected. And you can see the way in which the insertion of that bridge has brought a huge increase in connectivity. And that transforms directly into economic benefits. 3,000 jobs, a 40% increase in the, uh, in, in, in the visitors to St. Paul's, and to the, to the Tate Gallery. It's something like uh, way, way above any prediction, eight million uh, crossings um, a year. And uh, it's very difficult when we look at this image to imagine that in the past, the Thames was an open sewer. And, um, and in the mid uh, 19th century, uh, was responsible for cholera outbreaks, which in three ep epidemics, uh, consumed 26,000 lives. And it was the third ep epidemic that led to the parliamentary bill and Bazalgette's extraordinary response in terms of solving that crisis by a technological leap, which put in the infrastructure of sewage, but combined it holistically with below ground transportation, a noble uh, embankment, um, and um, and in a way, history does tend to, to repeat itself. And perhaps the, uh, the next crisis at the end of the 19th century was the great horse manure crisis. And, um, and London and New York were the most populous cities in the world. And it's difficult to imagine uh, the effects of something like 300,000 horses moving goods and people around New York and nearly 200,000 in London. The average life of a horse was three years. They were cut up in the streets. The stench was appalling and the death toll was great. And, um, and as folklore has it, nobody could see the solution. And in less than uh, a decade, the, the work of, uh, of Ford and Benz, the automobile, was the, was the savior and cleaned up the, the cities in an extraordinary way. Another crisis in the history of London was the Great Smog of 1952, which a 30 mile wide band uh, claimed something like an estimated 12,000 lives. And, um, and again, technology came to the rescue again in the form of the Clean Air Act, which was an important political initiative, but that led to the transference from coal burning, heating to, uh, to gas. And, um, 
But these are kind of local historical incidents. Perhaps the big change today is that those effects are, are magnified. So if we look at urbanization just in terms of one emerging economy, uh, China, then you can see that we're talking here about one London per year for something like 32 years. And not surprisingly, um, Beijing goes through uh, a similar uh, period. Quite recently, 2016 survey showed that the deaths from, uh, from, uh, from the atmospheric pollution um, were accounting for one third of deaths, second only to those caused by, by cigarette smoking. But that has changed very, very dramatically in a similar way. There's been a big swing from coal-fired to natural gas. And so Beijing is very, very fast cleaned up, but pollution is still a major consequence of climate change, of, um, of greenhouse gas uh, buildup. And what was local in terms of London or a small a, a city like Beijing, uh, cumulatively, uh, is, is really now a shared phenomenon. <coughs> So what is happening on one side of the globe becomes everybody's issue, everybody's uh, problem. And greenhouse gas emission may uh, seem quite uh, kind of remote. A polar bear sitting on, a, on an ice floe, which is slowly melting. But really, when you bring that closer to home, and, um, and London is one of those cities which is within that 50% of the world population, within 100 kilometers of the coast, and 75% of the cities are on the coastline. And um, we've already seen the effects of that in terms of recent, uh, recent weather, typhoons, rising sea levels. And um, is this the, uh, the London of the future? And, uh, and how do we start to analyze the forces at work? And what are the tendencies? What are the things that can and should and are being done uh, about it? If you look at the breakdown in terms of global greenhouse gas emissions, agriculture is a big player, transport and buildings. And of course, the movement between buildings is the infrastructure. So that's the infrastructure and the buildings energy, the production of energy, uh, and industry. And if we kind of take those and analyze them uh, one by one, and we start off with the production of, of, of energy, we're seeing that shift from coal burning to gas, and eventually moving away from fossil fuel. And of course, if we reduce the amount of energy that our buildings consume, and we move towards buildings that harvest energy, then that starts to, to go down. And we'll talk a little bit more about the, the kind of solar revolution. Um, if we come to the, uh, to the next strip, which is the movement, the, the movement between, uh, between buildings, between cities, uh, we're seeing certain positive tendencies, uh, which we'll also touch on later. Uh, buildings, obviously, and, um, and agriculture, some, I think, very, very large changes to the countryside and, and patterns of agriculture. The magnitude of those will depend on the economies different in uh, here in Europe from, uh, from say an emerging economy in Asia where the deprivation of rural life has led to the exodus uh, and the growth of the cities, the global growth of, of, of cities. Um, and. Um, if we are something like more than 50% now, then by 2050, we're, we're talking in excess of 70%, which will be, uh, which will be urbanized. And that exodus uh, from the rural areas is most likely uh, a move initially into a favela, an informal settlement, or putting it more bluntly, uh, a slum. And 14% uh, of humanity at the moment is in slum conditions. And that means that most are without power, not able to throw a switch, for lighting, for cooking, for heating, um, not clean water, uh, and not modern sanitation. And that 
is predicted to grow to double by 2030 and to be 3 million uh, by, by, uh, by 20, 2050. Those areas are the green areas which enable us within the red areas to live to the standards that we expect um, and the green areas are making that possible. But those green areas will eventually, it's a moral responsibility, if you have power, you live longer, greater life expectancy, you have more political, uh, sexual, social freedom, less violence, it's a statistical uh, reality. So to achieve that leveling across the globe means that we have to be more efficient. We have, in terms of to reduce consumption, to increase efficiency, we have, in those immortal words of Buckminster Fuller, we have to do more with less. And that means, simplistically, as a generalization, moving from an economy or a building or a city where stuff goes in at one end and waste spews out at the other. It's a move, a greater move to a more circular economy where recycling is taken for granted, where waste is converted into, into energy. And um, I think that uh, for my generation, we were introduced intuitively in the 1960s and the 1970s through Rachel Carson, uh, who drew attention to the detrimental effects of DDT, as it was at the time, Buckminster Fuller, who coined the phrase planet Earth and drew attention uh, as the astronauts were discovering and seeing the globe for the first time, the fragility of the, of the planet. Stuart Brand, probably the end of the analog uh, era, into the sharing of the, of the digital age, the hippie movement. If I look back at the projects which typify that period, unbuilt, there was the, uh, the regional plan for Gomera, a small island off uh, Canary Island, uh, off North Africa. And just one image from that, in a way, all the ingredients that we talk about are there. There are the solar cells, there's the wind power, there's the batteries under the floor, there's the WC, which is connected to the composting unit, something that will be developed eventually by NASA uh, to be totally autonomous uh, in space. All the ingredients are there. And whether it's a, <coughs> a regional plan or an individual building, there was this uh, project which brought three Olson companies uh, together uh, in a forest uh, in a suburb just outside Oslo called Vespi. And, um, and those buildings are lifted up above the ground. And, um, and a drawing of the early 1970s, I think it's probably 1972, it was drawn by Birkin Howard. And, um, and it talks about recycling, it talks about a building that will breathe, that will work with nature, that celebrates sunlight, that has great views, that connection with, with nature. That was very subjective in our thinking. It's been a powerful design generator and driver ever since, but there have been some interesting more recent changes. And this was um, a deliberately accessed by trails through the landscape. It was preserving the landscape, keeping the cars at the edges of the, of the site. And I realized, looking back as I walked around the Apple campus, that in a way it was almost like a mini uh, experiment anticipating uh, an Apple campus. So those routes through the landscape also resonate in a recent project here in the city of London for Bloomberg. And the route in question was the old Roman road, Watling Street, one portion of which still exists. And that route was the inspiration for the design. It inspired the idea of an internal arcade, a continuation of Watling Street in the top left-hand corner there, that would uh, link into a sequence of public spaces. Again, um, very, very difficult for me to separate the architecture here from the infrastructure. 
creating a public route, but also at the same time creating three public spaces. And here in this image you can see that arcade that penetrates, that creates permeability. It's a main flow from the, uh, the tube station, so it's a natural desire line, and that brings to life the pedestrian domain, the, the pavement level with new restaurants, galleries, uh, shops, and the creation of a public space which is, marks the entrance, celebrates Rents and Stephen's Walbrook, um, a public space which is fronted by a major sculpture um, which acts uh, as, a, as, a, as a security barrier, but of course you would never know it. It's a, it's a work of art um, linked into the planting of trees. And those trees, of course, will eventually, in the life of the building, mature. And that touches on a kind of story within a story. It's that subjective element I was talking about earlier on the Vespi project. The idea that sunlight and nature and a changing environment would somehow be desirable. And what has happened since then is that that has been scientifically qualified, quantified, excuse me. Um, and through a series of experiments and tests, mostly and most recently through the uh, the Harvard School of Public Health, um, and using an interesting test facility that could, with a, with, with a test group in the cubicles above, above uh, a machine plant that would simulate the conditions of a conventional building, a green building, and a super green building. And those results which have been published are quite extraordinary. I wouldn't suggest that you read the fine print here. The brown is a conventional building. The next green is a green building. And the kind of tall pinnacle there is a super green building. So, uh, so the breathing building, which we have since those early Vespi days, uh, developed further. Perhaps the first um, example was the Commerce Bank Tower in Frankfurt. But here, those are essentially shallow spaces. The big challenge is how you make a deep uh, space uh, work in terms of breathing. And also, um, if you take the facade of the building, here very, very challenging because you're in a noisy, polluted street environment. So those fins, those bronze fins, which are working in some ways to give solidity to the building visually, so it's not just another glass box, um, are also filtering and attenuating the noise through. And um, I could spend the whole evening just talking about the research which made this possible. And if, I'll just give you a, a film glimpse of one of several uh, tests. This was a building within a building, a warehouse in Battersea, and this test facility was constructed something like 135 uh, square meters. And here you can see the, the outside atmosphere is, 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 is changing. You have the, the dummies which monitor the, uh, the conditions over a wide range of different environments. You see how the smoke here is simulating the airflow, the way in which the findings are computed, and, and eventually it's peopled by real people rather than just dummies. And, um, and if we move to a kind of cross-section through the building, then you can see that this deep space at its heart is a pedestrian spiral which connects all the levels. Um, uh, and, and that spiral is linked to the light and is also the point at which the air moves from the outside and goes up through this kind of vortex of a space. And, um, and here you can see that in reality, you can see the stepped ramp. Uh, the vortex starts right at the entrance experience. And that's a sculpture in the ceiling by Olafur Eliasson. It's the only level where you can't see through. All the other levels are permeable. The ramp connection, the pedestrian uh, link go, goes through. And the circulation is deliberately, uh, how can I say, um, 
is deliberately uh, tailored to the social interaction within the building. So whatever level you work at, you have to go to the pantry, which is the social heart of the building at level six in nine of the 10 uh, working levels uh, within the building. And, um, and here, just to touch on some of the innovations, the inventions, the previous image, you would have noted that there's a wooden floor normally. A wooden floor makes it impossible to have as an acoustic environment. It's the ceiling which makes that possible. And also a wooden floor is normally impossible to be able to move around. But here we invented uh, a wooden floor that had a magnetic backing so that the full access possibility below where you can open up any element of the floor to rewire, to reconfigure the spaces. And that ceiling is something like two and a half million small aluminium petals. And one half a million of those petals contains a small LED light. So it's working acoustically, it's working as a light fitting, um, but importantly, it also has water flowing through it. So that makes possible the breathing building and the environmental control. Of course there are energy savings, but the prime motive here is creating a healthier uh, working environment. Um, the building has, through other devices, and here I just show the patent drawings from 1975 of the system that was developed for aircraft and as vacuum system. So if you use a bathroom in this building, it looks completely normal. You would never know it. It's invisible. The reality is that the system uses 20%, only 20% of a conventional uh, bathroom. And that is recycled rain water, rainwater, which is harvested uh, from the roof. Adding all this up, it gives the lead rating of something like 98.5, which is the highest that the building has ever achieved. Um, as Mike Bloomberg kind of quipped, what happened to the other one and a half percent? Um, but, um, but anyway, there are other findings that will, if we pursue the whole lead story, um, will bring you to the conclusion that even the highest lead rating doesn't yet marry, uh, meet the requirements of the Paris uh, Accord. Also, the building is a demonstration of being able to achieve high density with a relatively low building, which reaches right out to its site perimeter. And it is the same occupancy as an urban site in downtown um, Philadelphia for Comcast, the same number of people. The 10 stories here compares with the 60 stories, but in the tall building, uh, that is, uh, there's a huge element of hotel. So, but you're still comparing it with 39 working floors. And again, um, although it is a, a tall building, it engages very, very fully with the uh, pedestrian domain, which really penetrates deep into the heart of the, of the building. And if we just take a quick kind of move through from the outside opposite the, the church, which fronts this, uh, this glazed, exterior, we go into a public space. From below, you would come up from the subway, so something like 99% of the working population arrive by public transport, always good in terms of sustainability. Art is a major element integrated into this. You can see the Conrad Shawn Cross, uh, and in the ceiling, uh, as you'll shortly see, uh, there's the work of Jenny Holt, which is bringing through uh, the writings of the Constitution, uh, in, uh, which, which started in, in, in Philadelphia. Um, and, um, and that, as a, on the skyline, the hotel perhaps, it looks like another office building. In actual fact, it is not an office tower. The office tower for Comcast is immediately uh, next door. It is a kind of vertical uh, Silicon Valley. Uh, the mix, the kind of breakout spaces, uh, 13 of them, each 13 three stories high. And those serve uh, floors which have, in many ways, an uncanny 
resemblance to the, uh, the pods uh, within the, uh, the Apple building in the sense that it's a shared team space and to one side rather than both side uh, compartmented spaces. And that, um, as it were, vertical interpretation of your classic low-rise um, Silicon Valley uh, environment uh, leads us naturally to, uh, to the Bay Area, to Cupertino. And um, impossible here to relate to that environment of strip malls, the highway, and uh, the earliest conversations with Steve Jobs were on the, the way in which it was the kind of fruit bowl of America in his youth. And the idea that perhaps with a very large site, a site which doubled in size during the, uh, the design phase working uh, with him, became translated into that California landscape complete with the peach blossoms, and, um, and so the transition from the original site, which was Hewlett Packard, and a whole collection, 24 buildings set uh, in tarmac. And here you can see uh, the kind of before and after. And if you just look at the statistics, you'll note that something like half the site was covered in tarmac. Um, and the transformation into this green landscape and one major building and two or three smaller ones. Um, and just at this point, it, any conversation on this building kind of, um, it seems in a way that the circle was an instant kind of one liner. The reality is that it came out of a very prolonged process, which was almost a year in the making. And I tried to kind of give an indication of this. The first meeting was very much an initial meeting, although that conversation would almost describe uh, the building as it's finally uh, emerged. Then you can see from this sketch that many different iterations were explored before finally, in June of the following year, from that first meeting in 2009, it finally clicked that the internal requirements of the ideal pod as a working uh, element unit and the external uh, shape finally uh, merged and produced the building as we know it now. And there's a short film clip here which uh, communicates some of the feelings of that building in the landscape. It's something like 463 meters diameter across. It's a site of 175 uh, acres and the Steve Jobs Theatre, which is um, alongside it, um, is a, a disc which is something like 47 meters across. It weighs 70 tons. It's a composite roof and it's entirely supported on the circle of glass and the services that feed it, the lighting, all the, all the services move uh, between the sheets of glass. So we're talking about a structural glass wall, which is some, uh, in imperial terms, two inches thick. It's four uh, levels. So this disc kind of hovers in the, in the landscape in the same way that the building itself touches kind of delicately down on the ground. And here we see it set in the, uh, in the recreated um, orchards uh, that now comprise the landscaping. And these uh, kind of, um, kind of brief soleil, they're part shading, they're also acting as light reflectors. So the light reflecting from above is bounced deep into the heart of the building. And from below, uh, although they're white glass, uh, they're, they appear as a mirror and they reflect the greenery of the landscape beyond. But also the junction between these very large uh, sheets of glass, something like 55 feet uh, long, and these um, extensions, these kind of eyebrows of the building, give the clue in terms of the way that the air moves from the outside of the building inside. So this is, again, a building which is totally independent by virtue uh, of its powerhouse,
um, its fuel cells, the photovoltaics on the roof is totally independent and its landscape is also uh, absorbing carbon dioxide from, uh, for the neighborhood. And, and here you can see the air movement through the building. What you don't see is the way in which it's built and the finishes which are almost like marble on the soffit of the precast elements to an extraordinary level of finish. So the material, the materials are really quite humble, but the nobility is in the workmanship, the crafting, very large elements, extremely small tolerances, and fine bore tubing which goes through, uh, which makes them like hot or cold radiators. A technology, interestingly, that goes back to those Team 4 days, the Reliance Controls factory, which in the drawing below, you'll see those fine pipes running through the concrete, a kind of invisible uh, planar radiators. And um, <clears throat> if we look at any of the press coverage on the, on the project, it, the recurring analogies with space, liftoff, um, spaceship, is recurring pretty well in almost every reference in the, in the media. And, um, and that, in a way, resonates across history. The idea that something has landed and can be airborne and can be free of the bounds of gravity and the Earth. And whether that's Gulliver's Travels, it's, I don't know, 1776, Jonathan Swift, and here his flying island held aloft. Uh, and in the heart of that island is the, is the big cave that will collect all the rainwater and feed the, the inhabitants. Or whether it was Alexander Graham Bell and his man-carrying uh, kite. Or whether it was the Russian futurist in the 20s. This idea of a city that could be free of Earth free of the encumbrances of everything that connects it to gravity, to the Earth. And uncanny resemblance here to the Stanford NASA project of 1975, which wasn't nearly 500 meters across, but was 1.8 kilometers wide. And a torus, a, um, a tube of the circle, 130 meters, that would house a population of 10,000 compared with the 12,000 of the, of the Apple building. And in 1975 was the same patent by this guy with the pneumatic bathroom toilet system that enabled those millions right now who are aloft and are not connected to anything in the earth, millions on cruise ships, flying through the sky, trains, um, and in that same spirit, Bucky's patent for a bathroom, I remember him talking about the fog spray, would use a fine spray, conserve water, recycling. It was destined for the solar house that we worked on together, one for our family, one for his family. Sadly, never realized it was the year of his death in uh, 1983. In the same spirit, our own explorations in terms of uh, lunar habitations, again, having to be self-sufficient, free from Earth, free from any infrastructure uh, below the ground. And we know from our own experiments in Mazdar that one uh, solar field like this, that only 40% of its electricity can sustain a university blazing light, highly energy, consuming day and night. Um, and if you link that through to the falling cost of solar in terms of photovoltaics, um, and importantly, to be able to harness that by storage capability. And one could talk at length about the investment in China into battery technology. Here you can see it very, very graphically. Tesla as the kind of lone counterpart out in Nevada there, and a little blob somewhere in Europe, and then this kind of Everest of activity, research, and production uh, for the future. And um, 
and the Bill Gates Foundation working with this university in Colorado, harvesting the solar and exploring the idea of a, of a, of a bathroom, a toilet, that could be free of the network of underground uh, services. And, um, and some of the personal passions which have resulted in uh, the concept of a heart unit which would trade on the automotive uh, industry to be able to create a compact unit where instead of individual cookers, heaters, refrigerators, belching out waste heat and so on, everything would interact together. And that has led to a, a very important uh, study by the Norman Foster Foundation, which is headquartered in Madrid. And here you can see a workshop which goes back on robotics to, um, <coughs> to last uh, November. And working with MIT and, and ETH, uh, a very, very interesting project to promote the idea of the cities without infrastructure. And how might that work in terms of those informal uh, settlements? Because traditionally, uh, it would be free of, of this is <coughs> below Piccadilly Circus, what we take for granted in terms of the, the underground infrastructure. And the, we talked a little about the, the favelas. And, there is no way that the traditional approach to bulldozing communities like that, which interestingly from the small amount of research which we have undertaken, seem to have very, very strong community ties within these uh, settlements. The idea that you can raise them to the ground and bulldoze is, is, is simply not realizable. So I think the, the interesting challenge is given all that we know which is emerging in terms of or, autonomous the idea that an individual dwelling can harvest energy more than it needs to to consume so do we really have to dig out roads uh, already we're seeing enough signs that infrastructure can adapt and in this favela here in Rio de Janeiro, has now a public transportation system which works over. What would happen, though, in a community like this if you have a medical emergency? How does the ambulance get there? If there's a fire, how do the fire services get there? How can it work without roads, without that kind of traditional infrastructure? But what if the drone, which is already passenger carrying, what if the drone firefights? What if the drone is an ambulance? And then, if it works with that immediacy in a favela, why would you be hanging around in a traditional city waiting for the ambulance to get through the traffic jams? You'd have that technology transfer into not just the informal settlements, but the formal settlements, the city as we know it here. So, and once you have the artificial intelligence for separation, then the way that birds swarm, drones can similarly swarm. And <clears throat> again, we're witnessing the whole mobility revolution. When you put together, as, um, as Robin Chase, uh, who founded Zipcar, was saying, we're on the edge of a revolution the 60-odd percent of space consumed by the cars in the cities. If you have Uber and it's automated and it's safer and it's faster, you'll be down to cents per mile. And what does that do to some of the conventional wisdom and thinking? It wasn't that long ago, probably the last talk that I gave here in London, that I'm talking about the three typologies of cities, the European low-rise, walkable, compact, high-density, the ultra-high-density city typified by Manhattan or Hong Kong, and the sprawling Silicon Valley could be Houston metropolis, could be LA, and saying with a diagram like this, 
Look at all the energy consumed by the sprawling city. You know, what great performers. And maybe in the end, the high density city survives because of experiences like today. The fact that we have that variety, that accessibility. Um, but the idea that it's the most sustainable is, I think, under threat because that graph is the cost of gasoline. It's old fossil fuel based. Once you're down to cents per mile, then all kinds of things start to change. If you don't have fossil fuel and fossil declines, what about the byproducts? Fertilizer. And fertilizer, if you don't have it, and water, and that's already getting scarce and will get scarcer. So what are you doing with agriculture in the countryside where there's no water, no fertilizer? You take it to the city. You've got fertilizer, you've got sewage, you can process it, liquid, solid, um, and you can process the waste into, into fertilizer as well. So whether that vision, whether the, when cars are platooning and they're essentially nose to tail, they're like the train. And the train and probably the road and the cars merge into one. And what then happens? Does the countryside become the great kind of absorber of the gases that will make the dense city sustainable? Or does it lead to some of the dreams of Broadacre if the infrastructure becomes invisible, autonomous, and mobility is pence or cents, um, and Ebenezer Howard suddenly seems radically new as the polycentric city. An interesting relationship there of that little segment is identical to Apple on its site. It's 17%, 83%, exactly the garden city of Ebenezer Howard. Does the gherkin really turn into a gherkin farm in its future life in the city? Uh, does the Thames go into some wacky doodle sort of green with things whizzing through the air? Do we go to have a picnic in Battersea Park and the picnic table disappears with us below the ground <coughs> and we pop up in San Francisco? Um, because of Hyperloop. And, um, and that San Francisco of today, our building in the background, lifted up to create a green space, will no longer perhaps be special because it's all green space. Um, and <clears throat> What is the city of the future? A city that flies, covered and integrated, maybe an airborne city, or a city that walks? Yesterday's visions are closer than we think. Smart technologies will connect entire cities, changing how we live and work. Physical distance will cease to be an issue. Off-grid homes and businesses will generate, store, and distribute free energy for all. Physical infrastructure will become obsolete. More public space, inner city vertical farms, Less trucks, less transport. Countryside will transform. Autonomous vehicles and Hyperloop reinvent public transport and logistics. Car parks, petrol stations, and garages disappear. Efficient use of existing roads and motorways create modern green belts. Green and self-sustaining polycentric cities at last could become a reality. Evolve and adapt our existing cities and design new ones that work in harmony with nature and our precious planet Earth. I finish where I started. I go back 67 years. I've just left high school. 
It's my first job in a building I've already described. <clears throat> At that time, if I wanted to make a phone call, I'd go to a phone box and I'd put pennies in a slot. First, I'd look up the number in a telephone directory. Not Greater Manchester then. If I wanted a long distance call, I'd place it verbally with the operator and I'd have to put a lot of money in the slot. If I wanted the contents of my local library and the library, the central library in the middle of Manchester, if I wanted every one of my favourite films at one of the five cinemas that was within walking distance of my home, if I wanted my favourite television programmes, if I wanted my favourite radio programmes, if I wanted the music, the jazz, the classics, the opera, if I wanted it, everything that had ever been done in the world, if I wanted to be able to take a photograph, if I wanted to produce a letter on a typewriter, a piece of antiquity, if I wanted to switch on the light in my home when I'm a thousand miles away to turn the heating up and down to make sure it's secure, if I wanted with a watch to be able to read how many kilometers I'd cycled to see the Lovell radio telescope in Cheshire, to know how many hours I'd slept last night. And I could do it all 67 years ago with something that I could hold in my hand and put in my pocket. What do you think I would have said? You must be mad. So probably everything that I've shared with you tonight is totally conservative. It's going to be really different and exciting. Thank you.